Module 10, Internal Instability. This presentation is mainly focused on the geometric condition for initiation, in other words, susceptibility to internal instability, which is the current state of practice, whereas the hydraulic condition for the internal erosion process of suffusion and suffusion is considered state of the art. Here are the learning objectives for this module. Explain the internal erosion process, perform a screening for susceptibility to internal instability, assess the geometric condition for initiation, and lastly, explain the hydraulic condition for initiation. During this presentation, we will provide an overview of the internal erosion process of suffusion and suffusion. We will also discuss methods to assess the susceptibility to internal instability for screening, the geometric and hydraulic conditions for initiation, more and less likely factors, provide a quick overview of the toolbox, and provide our references. Overview of internal erosion process. Internal instability describes the loss of soil particles as a result of seepage in which the finer particles in the soil are able to move within the soil mass under the forces imposed on the particles by seepage flow. Therefore, it is a geometric condition, not an internal erosion process. Suffusion is an internal erosion process defined as selective erosion of finer particles from the matrix of coarser particles of an internally unstable soil in such a manner that the finer particles are removed through the voids between the coarser particles by seepage flow leaving behind a soil skeleton formed by the coarser particles. Because the coarser particles are in point-to-point -point contact, if the finer particles erode, the coarser particles remain in place. Suffusion is a similar internal erosion process. However, the coarser particles are floating in a matrix of finer particles. If the finer particles erode, the coarser particles settle into space left by finer particles. The two processes are distinguished by the washed out soil structure that remains. For suffusion, the voids are underfilled such that the volume of finer particles fits within the voids formed by the coarser particles. Therefore, effective stresses do not load the finer particles. The seepage-induced mass loss results in little or no change in volume and an increase in hydraulic conductivity, so the soil structure remains intact after migration of fine particles. For suffusion, the voids are overfilled such that the coarser particles float within the finer particles and effective stresses load the finer particles. The seepage-induced mass loss results in a reduction in volume and a change in hydraulic conductivity. So there is some form of destruction or collapse of the soil structure that accompanies the migration of fine particles. This slide examines the differences in the mechanisms between suffusion and suffusion. For suffusion, since the coarse particles are in point-to-point -point contact, effective stresses do not load the finer particles. Although finer fraction erodes, there is no volume change, but the impact on the structure is an increase in permeability due to the remnant coarser skeleton. For suffusion, since the larger particles are matrix supported, effective stresses load the finer particles. If erosion does occur, volume change can result in sinkholes or deformation in the overlying embankment. Suffusion is less likely under the stress conditions and gradients typically found in embankment dams. We are not aware of any case histories leading to breach. Therefore, suffusion is considered a secondary mechanism that can lead to one of the primary processes of internal erosion. Suffusion first results in an increase in permeability, greater seepage velocities, and under potentially higher hydraulic gradients, accelerating rate of suffusion. It can then lead to transport of substantial amount of fines that can cause clogging and occasionally hydraulic fracture. At the top left, sloughing of the downstream slope due to increased seepage flow 
results in a higher permeability shell after washout. At the top middle and right, settlement or sinkholes may occur as the overlying adjacent finer materials are eroded into the remnant coarser matrix. And at the bottom, filters constructed of internally unstable soil will have the potential for erosion of finer particles in the filter, rendering the filter coarser and less effective in protecting core materials from concentrated leak erosion. BC Hydro's WAC Bennett Dam is a 182 meter high, two kilometer long zoned earth fill embankment dam located on the Peace River in northeastern British Columbia that retains the 70 billion cubic meter Williston Reservoir. The dam was constructed almost entirely of well compacted glacial moraines, which were sorted and blended to form core, transition, filter, and shell zones. In 1996, after 28 years of reliable operation, two sinkholes emerged on and upstream of the dam crest. Investigations revealed that the core materials beneath sinkholes were heavily disturbed down to bedrock, indicating that silty and widely graded soils may be susceptible to internal erosion. On the right, the sinkhole at the crest measured two and a half meters in diameter and was seven meters deep. An extremely loose zone was encountered to a depth of 80 meters, with a variable zone to a depth of 125 meters. The remediation method selected was compaction grouting, a method which injects at a drained rate columns of stiff grout bulbs into the damaged core material at very high pressures, 7,000 kilopascals. A key consideration for selection of this method was its ability to reestablish some of the stresses that were lost. BC Hydro's WAC Bennett Dam is a well-known and heavily studied case history. All materials came from moraine pits, which were deficient in medium sands. The range is shown in red. The wide, blended, till-like core was internally unstable. The transition and filter materials were gap-graded in the medium sand range. The coarse portion of the soils is shown in the photograph at the bottom right. Susceptibility screening. A quick examination of the shape of the gradation curve is an easy but important first step. Sherard, 1979, plotted a band around gradations judged to be internally unstable from sinkholes and dams of coarse, broadly graded soils, where internally unstable soil gradations usually plotted as nearly straight lines or as curves with only slight curvature within the range shown. Sherard's method is empirically based and designed to identify soils which will not self-filter, which is a different process than internal instability. However, non-self-filtering, very broadly graded soils, for example, glacial soils, that fall into the gradation envelope are also susceptible to internal instability. Look for characteristics of a gap-graded soil or a broadly graded soil with a flat tail of fines. These include widely graded or gap graded cohesionless soils in alluvium of a large river, colluvium in the bed of rivers and mountainous areas, embankment cores constructed of glacial origin soils, as well as filters with very broad or gap gratings or excessive fines content. A gap graded soil is one defined by a broad gradation in which a distinct portion is significantly underrepresented or completely absent. Reclamation discusses a 4X line in their design standard 13-5 protective filters from 2011. It is shown here along with Sherard's instability bands. It is a slope line, not a boundary, so any portions of a gradation curve steeper than the line indicates a stable soil. The 4X line is the same as Terzaghi's 1939 and Kenny and Lau's 1986 criteria of H over F less than one, which will be discussed later. Geometric conditions for initiation. A number of researchers had developed empirical methods to assess the potential for internal instability of a soil. Most methods are based on quantification of the shape of the particle size distribution curve and have been developed and or verified against laboratory test data. 
Given the empirical nature of these methods, most methods are not applicable to all soil types, but are considered only suitable for the type of soils that were examined in the original development of the methodology. Kesdi, 1979, and Kenny and Lau, 1985-1986, are two of the earliest criteria to assess the susceptibility of a granular soil that is subject to seepage flow to internal instability. Both methods require similar mathematical expressions where the secant slope of the grain size distribution curve indicates the likelihood of internal instability. The common feature of both methods is the examination of the slope of the gradation curve over a discrete interval of its length. The difference is from the criterion used to establish the size of that interval. Kesdi, 1979, calculates Trizaghi's D15 of the filter divided by D85 of the base filter ratio over the constant increment of percent finer by mass of H equals 15% at any point along the gradation curve. Kenny and Lau, 1985-1986, calculates the H over F stability index over the increment of D to 4D. Burankova, 1993, proposed a predictive method based on the results of laboratory tests of cohesionless sand gravel soils with maximum particle sizes up to 100 millimeters and coefficients of uniformity up to 200. Fannin et al. 2017 indicates that it is believed to be suitable for all soil types, but not much is generally known about the gradations used. According to Burankova, the internal stability of a soil depends on the conditional factors of uniformity, H double prime and H prime, where H prime is the D90 divided by D60 and represents the slope of the coarse part of the gradation curve. And H double prime equals D90 divided by D15, which can be regarded as a compound index involving the slope of the coarse, D90 over D60, and the slope of the middle fraction, D60 over D15. Boundaries were defined separating stable and unstable soils. Zones one and three represent zones of unstable soils, Zone two represents a zone of stable soils, and zone four represents a zone of artificial soils. Testing by Juan and Fell at the University of New South Wales indicated the Burankova method did not give a clear-cut boundary between internally stable and unstable soils in the data set for silt sand gravel and clay silt sand gravel soils. Their test data was supplemented with the laboratory test data from other researchers and logistic regression was performed to define contours of equal probability of internal instability, excluding the outliers B1 and D1 in the University of New South Wales test data. This slide presents the relationship for silt sand gravel soils and clay silt sand gravel soils with plasticity index less than 12 and clay fraction less than 10%. The Burankova zone 1-2 boundary is shown for reference. This slide presents the relationship for sand gravel soils with less than 10% non-plastic fines. It used the same database of laboratory test data from other researchers, but only excluded the University of New South Wales test data with KLN fines, including University of New South Wales samples 4R, A4, and C1. The contours on this figure predict higher probabilities of internal instability than the previous slide because of the more erosion-resistant clayey, silty soil samples in the University of New South Wales data set have been excluded. Experience in using the modified Burankova method led Juan and Feld to realize that soils with a steep slope on the coarse fraction and a flat slope on the finer fraction were likely to be internally unstable. Their alternate method is similar to the Burankova method but uses D20 over D5 instead of D90 over D15. The D20 over D5 ratio represents the slope of the finer fraction. This figure shows the two boundaries, one beyond which likelihood of internal instability is low, and the other defining an area in which soils are highly likely to be internally unstable. 
This method is not able to identify internal instability of gap graded soils. Leon Fannin, 2008, indicated application of the Kesdi and Kinney and Lau methods to the literature database has mixed success in assessing the susceptibility to internal instability for gap graded and widely graded soils. Their comparison indicates the D15 over D85 filter ratio of the Kesdi method is relatively more conservative for a mass passing or F less than 15% and the minimum stability index of the Kinney and Lau method is more conservative for F greater than 15%. These observations led them to combining aspects of the two methods where the Kinney and Lau method applies for F less than 15% and the Kesdi method applies for F greater than 15%. Kenny and Lau, 1985, indicate the maximum content of loose particles that can exist within compacted granular material is F less than 20% for widely graded soils with a coefficient of uniformity greater than 3, and F less than 30% for narrowly graded soils with a coefficient of uniformity less than 3. The combined criteria results in a trapezoidal shaped zone of internally unstable soils. The modified Kinney and Lau method requires converting the cumulative particle size distribution or grading curve from FD space to a shape curve in FH space, where D is the particle size, F is the mass passing, and H is the mass increment. This slide demonstrates how the conversion is performed. The first two columns are the cumulative particle size curve. The third column is 4 times D. The fourth column obtains the mass passing F for 4D by interpolating on D in the first column. The fifth column obtains H by subtracting F in the second column from F at 4D in the fourth column. Particle size distribution or gradation curve in the previous example is shown on the left, and the equivalent shape curve in FH space for F less than or equal to 40% is shown on the right. Since the coefficient of uniformity is greater than 3, the soil is considered widely graded according to Kinney and Lau, and the F less than or equal to 20% criterion is used to define the unstable boundary, along with H over F less than 1 in H less than 15%. The figure on the right shows five particle sizes plot in the unstable zone of the modified Kinney and Lau method. The figure on the left shows the particle size or self-filtering deficiency between 0.3 and 2.8 millimeters of the gradation curve. When selecting a method to screen the susceptibility to internal instability, compare the actual gradation to similar shaped gradations in the testing database. While there is a variety of methods for assessing the geometric condition, it is suggested to use the modified Kinney and Lau method for gap graded soils from Lee and Fannin 2008 and the alternative method for broadly graded soils from Wan and Fell 2008 as primary criteria for assessing susceptibility to internal instability. If the soil is clearly not susceptible to internal instability and erosion of fine particles, it is unlikely that further effort is necessary. However, if use of such methods leads to uncertainty, laboratory tests should be conducted on actual soil gradations that carefully simulate the field conditions. Hydraulic conditions for initiation. The hydromechanical conditions are an area of ongoing research. Given that critical hydraulic gradient is generally poorly understood and that local hydraulic gradients are difficult to monitor in a dam, Suffusion suffusion is often assumed to occur if the materials are potentially internally unstable, according to Fannin et al. 2017. While the assessment of the geometric condition is the state of practice, assessment of the hydraulic condition can be considered state of the art. The hydraulic loading on the soil grains has been described by three approaches, hydraulic gradient, hydraulic shear stress, and poor velocity. Juan and Fell, 2004, provided some general observations on the influence of soil properties on the initiation of suffusion. Higher porosity leads to the start of erosion at lower hydraulic gradients 
but considerable scatter. Soils with clay fines erode at relatively higher critical gradients than in soils without clay fines at similar fines contents. Higher density soils erode at higher critical gradients with similar fines content. And gap graded soils erode at relatively lower critical gradients than non gap graded soils with similar fines content. Lee and Fannin, 2021, developed a theoretical hydromechanical envelope and relationships for critical hydraulic gradient in one dimensional vertical seepage. It is related to the soil gradation by alpha. With alpha equals zero, there is pure suffusion. Alpha between zero and one is moving towards suffusion, and alpha equals one is fluidization or heave. This slide shows the variation of alpha with shape parameter, or H over F minimum, and geometric index, or D85 over O50, where D85 is the 85th percentile of grain diameter in the finer fraction, and O50 is the mean pore diameter of the coarser fraction. Open symbols are upward flow test, solid symbols are downward flow test, and partially solid symbols are upward flow and downward flow test. The improvement using the geometric index is attributed to accounting for the effect of not only grain size distribution, but also grain shape and porosity of the coarser fraction. The methodology for the amount of erosion from suffusion is based on the ability of the soil to self-filter. In other words, the coarse particles prevent erosion of the medium particles, and the medium particles prevent erosion of the fine particles. Douglas et al. 2019 indicated that most of the eroded soil in laboratory tests using a continuing erosion condition was finer than 1.18 millimeters and the particles between 1.18 and 4.75 millimeters appear to self-filter the finer particles. The self-filtering was characterized based on the percentage of the soil between 1.18 and 4.75 millimeters and the percentage between 0.075 and 1.18 millimeters. Suffusion was very rapid, typically occurring within minutes of test commencement and at a hydraulic gradient of one. Note, Douglas et al. 2019 also evaluated global backward erosion, but this is generally considered stoping by USACE. More and less likely factors. This table can be used to help assess the likelihood of a soil being susceptible to internal instability. In other words, it addresses the geometric conditions only. This table can be used as a starting point, but the risk team must develop project-specific more likely and less likely factors to guide subjective probability estimation. Toolbox overview. Filter considerations. An internally unstable filter will have a potential for erosion of the finer particles in the filter, rendering the filter coarser and less effective in protecting the core materials from erosion. Evaluate the susceptibility of the filter to internal instability and then assess the likelihood and adjusted gradation as part of the continuation node using the RMC filter evaluation continuation toolbox. The RMC internal instability toolbox assesses the geometric condition for initiation only. The worksheets include gradation evaluation, some guides to help screening the susceptibility to internal instability, and then the various methods discussed in this module, including the Baron-Koba 1993 method for broadly graded and gap graded soils, the modified Baron-Koba method for broadly graded and gap graded soils from Wannenfeld 2004, the alternative method for broadly graded soils from Wannenfeld 2008, the modified Kenny and Lau method for broadly graded and gap graded soils from Lee and Fan in 2008. And lastly, it contains the suggested method for broadly graded soils from Douglas et al. 2019 to assess the erosion potential. References. The primary references associated with the methods discussed in this module are listed on this slide.